welcome to episode nine of Dano Says So. Tonight's guest, uh, the thing we probably have most in common is each of our first touring band was the same band. Uh, we sort of made our maiden voyage out into the world of touring musicians together. He's taken that mission quite a bit farther than I have. Um, anyway, uh, he made a name before that as a professional skater with a number of different in imprints. Um, but then most notably in my life as a drummer and in some of the most impressive acts you can imagine, uh, the idea that one guy has rocket from the crypt off, you know, now earthless, let alone things we did and half a dozen other things on his resume just kind of blows my mind. So Mario Rubelkalba, thank you for doing this. What's up? Thanks for having me, Dan. It's great to see you again, man. Likewise. It is amazing how much time has passed. Yeah. <laughs> right. So nobody is doing anything right now. So realize that when I say active, I'm framing that, not really meaning quarantine. But the vibe I get is that Earthless is your main thing or your passion. Is it the only thing that you were actively involved in at the time that this hit, or do you still play with multiple groups? Um, technically, I would say, you know, I'm, I still have involvement with other things. Um, mm -hmm. With that being said, uh, as of this moment right now, like, I – practice once a week with the earthless guys and um oddly enough our guitar player he's been living in the bay area for like the last i would say almost like seven years or something like that mm -hmm. and he right. just moved down back to san diego like literally like a, a month ago or two months ago right when the quarantine started but we just started playing together once a week like maybe the last like three or four weeks mm -hmm. so that's been a lifesaver actually i would say yeah. like mentally and like in so many ways just because what we've been you know kind of no one's been doing crap for the last three four months it seems like so i haven't seen anybody in, in the band that i do right now since february yeah. but i'm looking at you who music is more of a necessity in your life this is probably the longest drought you've ever been through yeah yeah man you know no, I, I was uh, a friend of mine called me today from germany he's been living there for maybe the past six months and he's from here and i grew up with him skating and stuff Mm -hmm. uh he, he's come to 411 shows and all that and uh he was just like so he's not a young boy <laughs> no 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 <laughs> very crickety but mm -hmm. um you know we were just kind of going over like everything that's you know it's just been so dormant and like you know like what have you been doing like <laughs> nothing like uh, is it how's how's it work uh you know the digs behind you look well stocked your your wife was very savvy and helping us get set up on the computer but yeah. for the family and you as a father, how does this work being an active, you know, I mean, how does it impact the household? I realize not everything probably rides on your kit, but it's still no, going to change. No. It's, but it's got to change things. Yeah. Oh, big time. Yeah. You know, I, I planned on taking 2020 a little bit easier as far as touring went because mm -hmm. the last, I would say the last two to three years have been straight touring, like mostly with earthless, you know, but mm -hmm. like a little bit of like hot snakes or like a couple rocket things here and there and off shows. Mm -hmm. But um, I I definitely wanted to take this year a little bit mellower and be home with the kids since uh, my daughter's, she's, you know, just turned one. So, um, you know, um, with that being said, I didn't think the whole year would be canceled. So. Right. <laughs> and then God knows how it is next year. Yeah, once all this stuff happened, uh, I just, you know, my wife, luckily, she still has her job and she's worked from home from the get-go. So okay. that didn't change fortunately, but she still has a job and she has a steady career and stuff. So um, we just decided, you know what, like, like that's the most important thing that she has consistent work. Mm -hmm. For me, I'll just, you know, we'll take the kids out of, you know, daycare and preschool and, and uh, I'll, I'll watch them full time at home, right. you know, and uh, that's what I've been doing. So that was a big adjustment just going from, you know, 24 <laughs> seven <Right. Mama. laughs> dad, mom. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's get into the music itself because it's an opportunity for me because we haven't talked in so long and what you do now is very different from what I have seen you do firsthand, right? Yeah. But, I mean, first off, first off, is Earthless your baby? And I mean, a lot of these other things you sort of you know you were sort of I think probably recruited by reputation or based on based on your notoriety. Yeah. You know, Earthless notoriety seems largely built around you and the other guys. So how does that make it different? And tell me what you get out of it. Tell me, tell me how that changes it for you. Well, it was, um, you know, it was a, an odd blessing in disguise, kind of a happy accident. You know, mm -hmm. I moved back 
to San Diego to join Rocket from the Crypt. And I was living in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I had planned to move to San Diego in like maybe a year. Mm -hmm. I, that was my, you know, goal at the time. I was like, I'll oh, give it a year to save up some money. And right. then this whole Rocket thing happened where like, you know, a couple of my buddies were like, kept telling me like, hey, they're, they're looking for a drummer. They've been looking for a drummer mm -hmm. for like a pretty long time, I guess. And right. um, so when I visited home, I just kind of went and hooked up and talked with some of those, with the guys and about maybe trying to jam some time when I came back in town to visit. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, when that happened, then that just kind of sped up the process of me moving back. They're like, whoa. Okay. Um, so I moved back to San Diego to join Rocket. And um, I think I was home for maybe six months and I just reconnected with some old friends. And uh, mm -hmm. that's how I met Mike, the bass player in Earthless. And, um, you know, we were just having food and kind of bonding over music. And, you know, we were into this obscure psychedelic rock you know music that was based out of japan and germany specifically right which there are two totally specific types of like you know how they interpret psychedelic rock and heavy hard kind of stuff so and mm -hmm. like no one else was into this stuff at the Which time you would have to spend two hours on this podcast to fully explain to me but anyway yeah totally <laughs> but it's a it was a very niche you know unique thing where like oh you like them you or you like them mm -hmm. you know probably like how like you know in there a long time ago like if you found someone that liked Detroit and right. you're like it hey was, you're, we, I'll, you're we can be friends you know it was a discovery you were speaking a language yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely so we we uh, had a we just got together and like casually like jammed one time with Isaiah mm -hmm. our guitar player and um and yeah man you know from there on it was all it was just a sporadic thing but mm -hmm. it was um just totally organic and, and it was it was something that took a long time for it to actually it was always based around other projects yeah. you know it was just kind of a, a, a thing that was to the side and um, but eventually we realized you know what we have a really cool chemistry here that's really like mm -hmm. you know we don't have to practice once a week you know if we don't want to we can like right. we can go months without practicing and go to like tour or something like that so it's a very yeah, a, lot of, a lot of muscle memory and a lot of flow yeah and just like this weird like Hendrix cream Im improvised jazz yeah. kind of like you know I mean, that's kind of how I perceive it which seems like maybe for a drummer like I have any idea what the fuck I'm talking about but seems like for a drummer it would be really fun yeah yeah it's 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 probably the truest truest expression that I've ever had on drums you know just to kind of like do whatever the hell I feel like doing and within you know working with two other guys that know what they're doing and like no one has to explain you know what what the hell's going on you know so well, it's as i got older and as some of the bands that i never did records in or anything i would the places where we went more re off reservation or where i'd go something with my voice where people just a lot of stuff i did in the ferry where people go what the fuck are you doing right i was like <laughs> i was like actually i'm having the most fun i've ever had so shut the fuck up you know <laughs> yeah so that's that's yeah, as close but... as i can come to getting it um, i would say you know yeah earthless is kind of it's a, it's definitely like more of my baby you know what i mean like right but it's, it's ours you know i don't ever call it my band or whatever it's just it's it's our creation that we've mm -hmm. i've just the one that i'm older i'm the oldest guy in the band and i've had the history you know mm -hmm. compared to those guys so um i get a little bit more um sometimes people just know it as my thing more so but it's uh yeah it's the last five years i decided to dedicate more time to earthless compared to the mm -hmm. other projects just because i felt for so long you know i've always based everything around those bands and put earthless to the side how does that come how does that come and go dynamic work for the other bands i mean i know that they play with other people yeah like, i mean so you know, that was one of the ever come to situations where the where the return door is not really open um well luck i mean it, <laughs> you, don't to, you don't have to I've give me any real inside baseball. I'm just more like talking about a dynamic, you know. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, you know what? Like in this day and age, like with Off and like Rocket and Hot Snakes, <laughs> I mean, there was you know tours have to be scheduled sometimes a year, six months in advance. Right. So, you know, you like we need to know: Are you available for this? You know, coming up next, you know, six months mm -hmm. from now. And you know, I'm like, yes. For so long, I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then when I started doing, you know, Earthless as a priority, then sometimes I'd have to miss out on rocket shows. And, um, you know, there was a couple off tours where I, when I decided to kind of change gears a little bit that, uh, you know, 
well, they got Dale Crover to fill in for me from the Melvins, you know? So it's like, poor, I understand. Poor babies. Yeah. What's that? It's the poor babies. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and I understand because there's, at, the, at that point, there was money involved and they got kids and, you know, they can, they got to do a tour and make whatever right. they do, you know? So that's just kind of how it's, how it works. So. Was that a weird thing to grow into? Cause I mean, you progressively, your life has kind of ended up in that role. It's happened when you and I have talked about things. You have to think about the practical financial implications of, your, of planning yeah. your music. Is that weird for a guy whose love of playing music is very real? You know, yeah. words, you know, you're, I mean, not, you're by no means a, a journeyman or a hired gun. So is it odd to have to think that way? Kind of. I mean, it, it was a little bit of shift because for so long, like, you know, I, I lost money on going on tour. You mm -hmm. know, we would lose money going on tour. We just did it because we're like, we got to do this. Right. And like, you know, and with that being said, it was like, okay, how you get, there's so many like costs that go into doing a tour and right. you're lucky if you, you're not, you know, you're, you come out in the green. So, you know, um, I don't know. I can't pinpoint when it got to that point exactly where yeah. I just started had, well, I guess when I started having kids is when right. I really, really had to be like a little bit more sharper about it because protect the nest egg. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you can't come home empty handed, you know? So, right. Yeah. It's a funny thing. When we were, when we were younger, was, how old are you? I just turned 48. Yeah. Okay. So you were, you're five, you're four years younger than I am. Right. And mm -hmm. when we were kids, that seemed like an ocean of time. There were times when I felt really felt like the old man in that van. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> because of a whopping three and a half, four year age gap. Right. <laughs> Yeah, I think I was I was 18. Yeah, well, now I play with, you know, there's a guy in my band who's nine years younger than me, and I think he's got more gray than I do. You know, it's like time, <laughs> time, time forgives all age. That's just all there is to it. Yeah. You know, you know, um, still not ready to get there. Still got philosophical questions written down about drumming. So you're playing a lot of different styles, and this sounds like a 17-year-old fanzine question, and I don't think <laughs> I would ask it of another musician who didn't have so, such depth of variety in his catalog. But is there a common thread between it? What makes the different gears enjoyable for you? One more time, you cut out in one what little kind bit. Of what, what makes different gears and different types of drumming enjoyable for you? Because you clearly haven't stuck with one groove through your whole life. You know? Yeah, you know, I mean. And how is it all fun? You know? I think just because I have diverse like eclectic i've just over the years i've grown my my taste and music has mm -hmm. grown you know pretty i mean i don't know i still th i still think i have kind of a closed mind when it comes to music so that makes me want to listen to more shit you know well, if, you're, like, if you've got a closed mind then i'm a fascist so <laughs> <laughs> but like yeah. with that being said it's like i i, I might like like a okay for for example there's this band called Tidal fight Mm -hmm. that's I've like i band. guess they mm -hmm. were like a, a straight edge band like a hardcore band like and uh i heard like the first three records and i thought they were i you know i did i did not like that stuff at all and then right. somewhere on tour i heard oh no we played a uh what's the grows rock fest yeah. in belgium so right. off played that maybe like in 2016 or something like that and then uh we had just finished our set and um and then like all these kids are rushing over to go see title fight and i was like oh mm -hmm. god like <laughs> hardcore orange orange county mania like you know hooded right. sweatshirts and everything i'm like oh fuck what's what's this all about mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden man like i i heard this like this guitar sound that was you know had a it was not a typical hardcore sound it had a little bit of like kind of a weird shoegazy effect to it right and like um if anything it kind of reminded me of a, a little bit more of a raw like like polished when when nirvana was polished right with like a little bit of like squirrel bait or something like that and like mm -hmm. who's you kind of melody and i was like and i kept and i was i was like on the on the artist tent you know like drinking some beers and stuff from like i kept going like this is title fight right. and like every song i'm like this is title fight like i have to give them like to give these kids a chance yeah and like the, and then the record um what what's the label that is part of epitaph anti I think it's called it's, really it's don't a know. sheet of epitaph, but they put out the last title fight record. Mm -hmm. And so I, I decided to go Spotify it. And like the last, 
all of last year that was like what i listened to the most on spotify like when i looked like there was some like weird like statistics thing it was like it was it was between title fight and Tor toy story 3 what was played the most on my spotify <laughs> i will tell you a really short story about why i worship spotify and <laughs> i had been resisting it for years yeah so you know none of my bands ever played with you know 411 never played with that nasty anything like that right you know Dag Nasty came out, came out in 2017, the same year I started the band I'm in now. And we played mid-bill with them, with that with the Sean Brown version of it, right? Right, right. And it's that's come up in a couple of these interviews, which makes me think I'm living a very limited life. But anyway, we played. We had a really good set. You know, we brought it. It was only our second show ever. I came away from it very happy with it, but not really expecting any feedback from them. And yeah. while we're waiting to get paid at the end of the night, I'm sitting around talking shit, and I didn't want to make any false overtures but i made some joke about being old men with brian baker and was kind of trying to have like this little do a conversation with a couple of people and he interrupts me and he's all yeah i really like your fucking band and i'm like well yeah thanks we had a good set he's no no we went out to the van and listened to it and i'm like how and he's all we went out and listened to it on spotify and i was like fuck back in the day we could not have gone and checked out somebody's recorded material five minutes right. after we saw him play yeah and i was like Get me to this Spotify. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a, uh, you know, from a musical, like checking out things perspective, it's, it's for me, I, I really like it because I listen to a lot of things I would never buy on the spot. You but know, you're a big time, you're a big time collector. And it's funny yeah. because the, the final market, that mm -hmm. niche market, it seems to be the point at which still, which bands find validation, even if they're only, putting out four or 500 copies of a record. Yeah. But without digital, nobody's hearing their shit. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a weird how they both merge together because, like, yeah. you know, um, I think people are a little bit more fickle as to what they'll buy. Like, right. so they go to check it out on YouTube or Spotify. Mm -hmm. and like, I mean, that's what I do. And I'm, I'm like, I'm not going to spend 20 bucks on a record that I just don't mm -hmm. know as much as I would when I was a kid. Right. You know? So I'll listen to it first. And then I will go buy the physical copy if I really, really like it, you know? Mm -hmm. I mean, at this point, I just, I have too much of the physical copies that I just mm -hmm. have to really be selective with what I want, so. Right. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I mean, as far as the convenience too, it, it's just so easy to, and, but I mean, from a royalty standpoint, it fucking blows, you know? It's like, you make pennies from so many, you know, I think they need to, improve on that structure the, the weird ass documentary and that it was to me it was really entertaining to watch but i thought it was very weird that john varvados and iggy pop were the money behind it but epics channel had this like four hour punk documentary right uh -huh. and one of the more honest things that i got out of it i'm not, neither a fan nor an unfan of fat mike but when they get to the episode sort of covering that era he goes if you, for a record rec label there's a very real point in time at which he went from making ten dollars off every album to making ten cents yeah and he's all the one thing that makes it a good filter is there's not a lot of people out there doing that you know doing music that don't love doing music because it's not the career it used to be right yeah yeah mm -hmm. so the 800 pound gorilla in the room would be 411 <laughs> right yeah. um you have, have you is is your situation with kevin kind of like your situation with me it's all online um more so but yeah. with kevin though um i have seen him a couple times just, yeah um he was living in prague for a bit he came I, I was in a band a few years back and when we played he came and hung out it was, it was a good thing yeah yeah he came to our show there in uh in prague so that was cool and uh we had a few beers and that was really cool and then right. he was in portland I don't think he was living there, but he was either he was there at the time with Brian Chu and okay. they came to our show there. So I saw him there and maybe like one other time. But yeah, other than that, it's just been through, you know, like Facebook. Or Cause you know, I, I'm fairly honest with people when they ask if we would ever do it again. It's like, well, one of us clearly doesn't need it. Uh, another one of us thinks he couldn't play the songs anymore. And then the politically correct guy who was like, we have to do it for the right reason at the right time. That being me. Um, <laughs> you, think it's, you think it's ever likely to happen? The windows will ever line up? You know, if you would have asked me five years ago, I probably would have like said like, I'm, I'm, this is, it's not something that I was like maybe super interested in, but like, mm -hmm. 
And then when we we talked about it, I think it was a couple of years ago. By 2017, now. when when Liz was the trying to shake in that tree because of the revelation thing, yeah. Right. Whereas you know I was open to it then, mm-hmm. but at that point it was so stressful schedule wise on my end that there had to there had to be something there to help make it work a little easier. That was the situation. That was the situation that taught me that music had come to play a very grown up role in your life. Was there, yeah. a, there was a practical aspect to it that you had to consider that I didn't because I was running a fucking bar. Yeah. You know? Yeah. There were, yeah, there was that being said. But then, like, you know, I've been thinking about it within the past, like, year and stuff. And, like, mm-hmm. and uh, I I would totally be – I think it'd be fun. And, I, you know, yeah. I haven't thought about it as far as, like, where to do it or what to do it, who to do it with. Mm-hmm. Right. Oh, oh, no, I was talking with my friend Atiba. We were um, – just whatever through Instagram, he was sent, he sent me these videos Mm -hmm. on YouTube of of us playing from somewhere. He's like, dude, it's like, this show is so sick. I was just like, Oh man, where did you find this? And I don't know, it was like somewhere on tour. And it was just like, he's like, man, you guys got to like play some shows again and stuff like that. And there's an outrageous, there's an outrageous show from Indianapolis where I'm like, I didn't know I was ever a part of anything that crazy. The kid jumping around naked and everybody's <laughs> backed up against the drum kit. And I'm like, that was my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, um, you know, but then that was at the time when like, I think judge and like quicksand and some bands were doing some stuff like that, you know, and like, I don't know. I, I think right now there's, there's a pretty good climate for where, what we would do would be justified. Well, my yeah. thing, yeah, my thing is that there's an intense social relevance to it right now. Big time. Like, yeah. Pete, uh, Pete time. Kramiak from Verbal Assault said that because, you know, era of Trump and all the bullshit that he felt was going on in the country, they were actually firing it up. Yeah. And the other guys were already practicing back east, and Pete had a plane ticket to fly back and everything else, and boom, quarantine. Yeah. You know? And so it's funny, like, music probably won't be on the table again before that's over. Hell, four one one is the only reason I might like to see that guy get reelected. I'm absolutely kidding, but, you know. Uh, but it's weird because like the two songs I thought of, mm-hmm. you know, when all this this shit really started getting pretty pretty like mentally kind of pounding was you know right. like, was of course like those homophobic and face the flag. Right. Those two like really ring true like lyrically and like just they're you know they're pretty pretty ahead of their time i think like musically <laughs> and lyrically like you got to think about all the people we exposed ourselves to it was a very lucky thing that man spent time with profane existence a shit a shit shitload of time really close to the real th- thinking sort of think tank center of the bay area everything i mean yeah. we were we were exposed to some pretty heady folks it was good it was a good thing yeah yeah for sure yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, we're gonna we're gonna have to fucking get Kevin over his 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 theory that he can't handle the songs anymore. Oh, I I, I work on him a little bit. Okay, <laughs> I, I keep I, I always check him like you know like when's the last time you play guitar or like right. you know like or like do you even own a guitar? And oddly enough, um, I I saw Josh. He came to a show that we played. I think it was Hot Snakes, um, mm-hmm. probably you know two years ago or something at Alex's bar. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was good to see him. And then uh, we te- he texted me, like, you know, maybe with, within the last six months ago. Yeah. And, uh, he's He's been playing bass. So he's, I know he still has it. He just doesn't say that he has it, but he, he's got it. Like, I know he mm-hmm. still plays. So right. I think he'd be down to do it. Yeah, I mean, I'm sporting, like, the COVID-25. You guys are going to have to give me a six-month warning, you know? <laughs> that, that's fine. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> hey, did so, Colin? Because uh, you play with Colin, right? And, I play and, with Colin, and his yeah. Hollywood cowboy you. ass stage presence is fucking awesome. It's amazing. <laughs> did he? I saw him. Did he tell you that we saw each other? And uh, I think, yeah, I believe he did. Yeah, because he works at the Rainbow, right? Right. I yeah. played this show, this this one off show, where I I just played with this older cat from the <laughs> the sixties at at uh, the Whiskey. And then so afterwards, um, a bunch of us just went to the Rainbow to go get some drinks afterwards. Mm-hmm. And then like, I was uh, just, I had never, you know, taken a little tour around it because I'd never been mm-hmm. there before. So right. we went into the, one of the other little rooms and he was what cleaning. What a trippy fucking building that is. We played, <laughs> yeah. we played there. He was like, hey, this room's closed. You guys got to get out. And then I was just like, oh, okay. And then he's like, he's like, hey, Mario. 
I'm like, yeah, I'm like, Colin. <laughs> 94, <laughs> man. He's like, I was just with Dan. That was a good. We just got off practice and stuff. It was no. a, we one of those there, moments. and then we had like the club hooked us up with a couple of pizzas after we played. We played in some half a fucking closet up into the dance floor by the DJ booth. You know, <laughs> at the top of a staircase where we had to like you know grease the sides of the amps to get them up. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and then we're down there eating the pizzas, and I was like, doesn't matter how busted that set was, I feel like I'm in Motley Crue. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Just because of where we were. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> God, you know, something I didn't even think about, not during the, like, 45 minutes where I was scrubbing up real quick and looking at old interviews of yours, and I was, I was like, you know what, one thing I was trying to remember, I was like, who the fuck was your, like, more metal skate band that you were playing in when Chuck introduced us? Because I had a clear visual the first time I saw you play drums because it just looked like just looked like a squid. It was just dreads and arms everywhere and fucking. But shit was everything was in perfect time. But it was committed. But yeah. yeah. Uh, <clears throat> the other thing I was thinking is more, a lot of people who do this and a lot it escapes a lot of people's knowledge. Most people don't know you didn't know for an answer to it. That's right. I, yeah. You know? And there's yeah. A, there's one great story that comes out of that, and it's not even from the tour, which is for people watching this. If you don't think he's a freak. You know, at the time, it seemed like maybe a little bit of an obscene reunion because we hadn't played in four years. Now we've done ones when we haven't played in 30. But we hadn't right. played in four years, and we get together at the first practice, and I had sent him a set list or a cassette or something. I think it was a 12-song set, right? Yeah. And the only person who knew the whole set and played it all the way through without fucking up that practice was you. <laughs> you, kept looking, you kept looking at me and Gavin like, what is up with you two? You know? <laughs> and we're the ones who fucking wrote it all. <laughs> you know, so everybody there's that about mario <laughs> well here here is my perspective on that was that like mm -hmm. i seem to remember it was kind of a i don't know if it was like a last minute thing where like we were like oh like hey we got to do this like you know and we'd head up to practice a couple times mm -hmm. I, I mean i don't seem to remember we had a lot of practice before. Oh, I think we, no i think we no i know i know that we only had a week from when i came down from the barrier to when we left because yeah. i lived in a pickup truck that week <laughs> I lived in the cab really? of a 1971 Ford pickup. <laughs> a two-bedroom <laughs> pick, pickup. Yeah, well, there was nobody. There was nobody in a big hurry to put me up because there were some weird things going on with my reputation, and I didn't want my family to know I was down there. Right. You know, <laughs> so I had access to this truck, and I was like, "It's a pretty big bench seat." I mean, I, I think I, I think I, you know, spent. I think an ex hooked me up with a with a night or two at a Motel Six and stuff. But I was pretty much like pickup truck homeless guy, and then on a plane to tour Europe, you know. <laughs> Listen, uh, the one thing you know, the one thing I would ask, and this could be a clumsy ass question, you could just say dumbass white boy, right? Okay. But is a lot of what goes on during this particular administration specifically offensive to you? You know, because I mean, this dude, this dude has been harsh on the southern border. And on people yeah. that don't look just like him. It's, I mean, I, I, I feel I'm lucky because mm -hmm. I feel like I, cause I, I mean, I was born here and my mm -hmm. family's all been, you know, been here my whole life. And mm -hmm. like for, for lack of, you know, I, my Spanish is like the worst. Like if I right. try to, speak, you know, I, I try to speak Spanish to someone that really knows Spanish or just like, shut the fuck up. <laughs> They're just like, stop. you know, Right. But then, like, I know, and I know how to get by. If I go down to Mexico, I can, mm -hmm. like, you know, I can ask for all the specifics, mm -hmm. food, like, whatever, like a place to sleep, or very simple right. stuff. But my Spanish is like so slang and, and incorrect that it's well, just like I just imagine. I just imagine the most po powerful office in the land fucking mad shit on my heritage, and I realize that's something I'm probably never going to be subjected to in this country. Yeah, you know? but like you know, if when I, if I if I'm on tour yeah. and I get in the Midwest or I'm in the South, mm -hmm. I really notice a difference of like how I'm looked at. You know what I mean? Like, or I have, you know, not all the time, but like I have, and it just makes me, I I feel, I feel lucky that I'm. I mean, you know, I'm I'm I feel I'm more Americanized. Mm -hmm. than some people I know, or like some right. people in my family. You know what I mean? Like my mom's cousins and like her generation where they're like predominantly spanish speaking right like there's definite like discrimination there and, and like it's um uh, yeah it's a it's a really sad 
um, you know, I guess just systemic sort of thing that seems like it's just kind of really starting to uh, get a get a hold snowball. Of yeah, yep. it's like catching fire all over the place, and it just. Yeah. It's a funny thing. I was I was I was wondering whether or not to whether or not to bring it up, and then I thought it's an opportunity I shouldn't pass on. There's interviews I have coming where people don't want me to introduce politics to it at all. Yeah, but I'm like well, politics is the only thing I know anything about. I can't fucking say. You know, <laughs> but yeah. uh, you know, like, like Scott, I, I've promised Scott Hill we're going to talk about muscle cars and Planet of the Apes. You know, <laughs> so you know, I've got my work cut out for me, but actually, I think that's going to be really fun. Well, listen, we're right around the mark. I've been cutting these off, but okay. I wouldn't want to get off without telling you. Uh, when I look back on it, when different, you know, most gifted musicians you've ever played with, most unusual personalities, people who would really, really be impressed to cross paths with. You're always top of the list. So I'm, I feel very lucky that you and I met, you know, and I thank you for Likewise, what we've done together. Cool. It's a, it's a strange, it's a strange thing. And that one day where, you know, my, when committed was in the studio, what was, mm -hmm. uh, I forget the name of the studio that we were at, but it was like, I tried to Mountain. remember all of this today and couldn't come up with any of it, but committed. You yeah. Know? <laughs> you know, committed but it was Chuck. strange because I remember when Chuck or you gave Chuck a ride to the studio to meet mm -hmm. up with us. Right. And, and I remember meeting you. And then fast forward, like a couple months later, like, you know, we had talked about trying to get together to, to jam and right. you drove down from Orange County to pick me up mm -hmm. at my grandma's house and drove back up. I remember it was yeah. a fat house. Yeah. <laughs> and then from there on, like, if I really think about it, my life mm -hmm. changed so dumb, like crazy from that. Well, day. I'm going to go ahead and volunteer that it was probably worth the gas to Vista for me too. So. <laughs> All right. Well, listen, sir, I'm going to call it a night. Uh, let's do it again sometime. All right, All right. buddy. Yeah. Sounds All right. good. Thank you so much, Mario. All right. Thank you, too. Later. Bye.